So any bishop will tell you, happily tell you, as you talk to them, that it's a tough job being a bishop. Multitasking isn't an option, it's a necessity. They have to be at one and the same time, so many different things, chief executives, HR officers, investment experts, estate managers, architectural consultants, communication gurus, politicians, not to mention all the religious side of their job as theologians, preachers, spiritual guides and counselors. In other words, it's a challenging job. And of course, with a job with that many talents, um, few are good at all of it. Uh, and this is abundantly clear when you look at history. Over the centuries, different bishops have excelled at different aspects of their work and also, of course, fallen down on different aspects of their work. What I want to do today is to illustrate this point by looking at the very different strengths and weaknesses of two successive archbishops of Armagh, uh, Christopher Hampton uh, and James Usher. In May 1613, Archbishop Hampton was consecrated in Armagh uh, as Archbishop, uh, a position he held until his death early in 1625. He was succeeded by James Usher, who also served as Archbishop till his death in 1656. The two Archbishops were very different in the, the manner of their appointments, in their background, talents, attitudes, and in their lasting legacies. Now, some of this was, of course, <clears throat> down to personal temperament, but they also represented, now, of course, this is why I've chosen them, they also represented two different forms of churchmanship and two contrasting attitudes to the Church of Ireland, attitudes which were to have a persistent importance right down to the 19th and 20th centuries in the Church. Hampton was a, an Englishman. I, I think this is a, a, a portrait from the collection uh, in, in Armagh. Uh, not a very good reproduction uh, of a not very good portrait, so I apologise for that. Uh, Hampton was a, an Englishman born around 1551 in Calais. He was the son of a, a Hampshire man. He entered Trinity College, Cambridge as a scholar and went on to a typical academic career, fellow 1574, MA. Uh, 1575, BD in 1582, and then he moved out from the college to become vicar of Chesterton, Cambridge, which he held from 1585 to 9. The key to his subsequent career was his appointment in 1606 as chaplain to Henry Rothsley, or Riothsley. He's one of those uh, wonderful um, uh, people whose um, name uh, we don't actually know how it's uh, pronounced. That, by contrast, of course, is an utterly wonderful portrait. Um, Riothsley was a, a prominent courtier. He was often linked to Shakespeare and Shakespeare's sonnets, um, uh, and on several occasions entertained James I, King James I, at his house. And of course, this afforded Hampton, his chaplain, uh, a golden opportunity for any early modern ecclesiastic of preaching before the king and securing his ecclesiastical advancement. And he preached three times uh, before the king in 16, between 1606 and 1609. And when you read his sermons, um, he was clearly <laughs> very shrewd. Uh, he emphasized the distinction between clergy and bishops, something James was very keen on, uh, and also stressed the importance of royal supremacy over the church, of course, which James was very uh, keen on. All the more so because James was struggling at this time to employ, impose royal, royal authority and bishops on the church in his native Scotland. Hampton was rewarded with a royal chaplaincy and then chosen for an important mission to accompany the king's commissioner to the 1610 Assembly of the Kirk in Glasgow, the meeting of the Scottish Church. This was the one that restored episcopacy to the church. And Hampton preached before the assembly, using his sermon to attack Presbyterianism, which of course didn't like bishops, and defend episcopacy. When in 1611 uh, the bishop, uh, oops, sorry. When in 1611 the bishop of Derry died, Hampton was nominated to succeed him. But before he could be consecrated, Armagh fell vacant by the death of Archbishop Henry Usher, and Hampton was chosen as Archbishop in April 1613. When you ferret behind the selection and look at the patronage involved, I think it's very significant. The main role was played by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who we know at this time was concerned at the issue of nonconformity in the Church of Ireland, and the other key figure was the groom of the Royal Bedchamber, John Murray, who was the key 
uh, Scottish uh, figure uh, at court. And this leads to the obvious suspicion that Hampton was being sent as a, a royal agent to sort out the Irish church, just as he'd been sent to Glasgow in 1610. And when you look at what Hampton did when he got to Ireland, this is amply confirmed. He was consecrated just before the first meeting of the Church of Ireland's convocation, which met in tandem with the Parliament in 1613. And he was horrified by the laxity of the Irish Church and immediately set out to try and bring it up to English standards. In a sermon which he preached before uh, the Irish Parliament, Hampton complained about what he saw as Puritan practices in the Church of Ireland. Now, Puritanism was a huge issue in the Church of England at this time, though not in the Church of Ireland. And um, uh, the king saw the Puritans as a threat to the unity of his church and his authority uh, uh, as supreme, uh, as, as governor. Um, the godly clergy, the Puritans, felt that the reformation of the Church of England had not gone far enough. Uh, and they objected to all kinds of ceremonial issues, such as the wearing of surface, the use of the ring in marriage, the sign of the cross and baptism, all of which they saw as remnants of Roman Catholic anti-Christianity. In 1604, the Church of England passed a new set of ecclesiastical canons, that's rules and regulations, disciplinary canons in other words, and by insisting that all clergy subscribe to them, the bishops forced out Puritan ministers from the ministry in the Church of England. And what Hampton set out to do uh, in his sermon was to um, insist that Irish clergy conformed on these issues and um, to keep order and decency, as he put it. And he finished his sermon with, a, with based what was basically a threat. Prepared I am with the rest of my brethren to endure and devour all pains that may breed peace, concord, and unanimity. Peace, concord, and unanimity meant, meant conformity, in other words. And I have the greater hope to prevail either by persuasive reasons, which of course please me best, or by discipline if the other uh, be refused. Well, it's a, a quite stark warning to the clergy to, 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 to shape up uh, and be obedient. The problem, uh, of all, however, only got worse. By the early 1620s, he was complaining to the authorities in England that certain factious and irregular Puritans had settled in the Ulster plantation. These were Scottish Presbyterian clergy who had, he complained, been welcomed into the Church of Ireland and were entertaining the Scottish discipline and liturgy that they do wrong to the church government here established. As well as seeking to bring the Church of Ireland into line with the Church of England by stamping out Puritanism, Hampton also took on a major responsibility, the re-endowing the re of the Church of Ireland as part of the Ulster Plantation. The plantation of Ulster from 1609 uh, involved a major transfer of land from the uh, tainted Irish earls of Tyrone and Tyrconnell to English and Scottish settlers. As the leaders of the plantation tried to move from Gaelic Irish land holding and inheritance to English land law and primogeniture, they discovered the anomaly of the Terman and Eranach lands. These had traditionally been part of the property of the medieval Irish church, but they've been held not by bishops or not even necessarily by ordained clergy, but by clerical families, uh, sometimes ordained, sometimes lay, and inherit the lands were inherited by the same family from generation to generation. These simply didn't fit uh, in an English style at church, uh, but the Church of Ireland naturally wanted these lands to become part of the endowment of the established church. The secular officials of the Dublin government eyed them covetously as a means of increasing the land available for plantation, but in the end, the king decided after uh, considerable lobbying by the Church of Ireland in 1610 to grant them to the bishops. Now, these were a substantial prize. In the county of Armagh, the archbishop received 48,000 acres, 15% of the country, five per times as much land as was allocated to the Scots in Armagh, and 75% of the grant to the English planters. These lands then, and the considerable income from them, had the capacity to transform the finances of the church and its bishops. This was all the more important because the persistent wars and violence of the 16th century, together with the weakness of the established church, had had a devastating impact upon its economic base. Amidst the confusion of war, rapacious Gaelic, Anglo-Norman and English laymen all competed to divert land from the church into their own hands. Irish bishops with local Catholic relatives and in many cases Catholic wives and children 
saw little future for themselves in a rapidly anglicizing church and took the fairly obvious, uh, if rather selfish, step of alienating sea lands for their families and friends. One bishopric, that of Cloyne in Cork, was famously reduced at the end of the 16th century to an annual income of just five marks. That's a mark is two thirds of a pound. And of course, the same dangers which had devastated Cloyne were also faced by the Ulster Seas in the early 17th century amidst the turmoil and chaos of the plantation. And of course, the lay planters, the English and Scots planters uh, in Ulster, were just as unprincipled, selfish and rapacious as their 16th century predecessors, and happily sought to include church lands amongst their own legal grants. Equally, bishops were faced with the temptation of putting personal profit before long-term endowment of their sees by granting long leases, 100 years, say 120 years, um, at minimal rent to friends and relations in return for a very large entry fine. So they got the short-term financial benefit at the uh, long-term expense of impoverishing the church. The government tried frantically to control this process of re-endowment so that the proceeds were not diverted by limiting leases to 21 years, but it was very difficult to enforce. And indeed, just before his death, Henry Usher had tried the Archbishop of Armagh, which Hampton succeeded. Henry Usher had tried to make a fee farm grant, this was the, uh, basically giving the land away, um, which meant that the grantee got the benefit of the increase in value of the land. He tried to give a, a fee farm grant of the whole of the archiepiscopal lands for £1,500 per annum and was only stopped doing so by the intervention of the Dean and Armagh who had to sign the deed. Hampton thus inherited both a major opportunity and a major temptation when he became Archbishop in succession to Henry Usher. The grant of the term in Aaron of Clans had revolutionised the sea's finances, previously in a parlous state. Presumably briefed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Hampton, upon arrival in Armagh, got down to negotiations with the current tenants of his sea lands and set about recovering the lands that had been illegally detained. We have from 1615 the rental of the bishop's lands, which amounts to about £850 per annum for the plantation county of Armagh, mostly from native Irish tenants. Over the remaining years of his episcopate, Hampton progressively increased the land in Armagh leased to more productive English and Scottish planters um, and increased revenue modestly in the process to 871 by 1622. When Usher succeeded in 1625 as Archbishop, it was already apparent that Hampton, Hampton had handed on the lands in Armagh plantation virtually intact. Nor was that all. In 1622, there was an Ireland-wide visitation and inspection of the church, and this meant that all bishops were required to submit to commissioners an account of their sees, the number, qualification of clergy, income, state of church buildings, and so on. Uh, and this gives us a comprehensive account of the see in Armagh and its condition uh, in, in uh, uh, seven, uh, two, nine years into uh, Hampton's tenure. The sea was uh, staffed with settler clergy. The plantation was clearly having a, a beneficial effect as there were a whole number of churches that were either in building, newly built or nearly finished. And it was noted that the cathedral destroyed by Shane O'Neill in the 16th century had been rebuilt and re-roofed with the archbishop paying for the casting of a new bell. In addition, he also paid for a new house in, uh, in Drogheda, a new palace in Drogheda, Drogheda uh, and another residence in Armagh. It's clear then that Hampton took good care of his diocese and was careful to invest in the improvement of his see. One vital but rarely noted explanation for the success of his stewardship is a very simple one. He was a bachelor. At a time when bishops were usually married with families, this was a not inconsiderable factor in the prosperity of the see under Hampton. He had no children to provide for, nor no dowries to give, no university fees to pay. He seems, as a result, to have devoted a significant portion of his personal income from the bishop's mensal lands to supporting the diocese. 
His successor, James Usher, was a very different person. Uh, this is uh, uh, now portraits of Usher are in interesting. There's lots of them. His chaplain, um, uh, Richard Carr, commented uh, about the many portraits of Usher that his face was so hard to hit that I never saw but one portrait that was like him. And the one he's referring to is this one by Peter Lely in the National Portrait Gallery in London, which uh, is an absolutely uh, fantastically enigmatic. Uh, portraits of this most interesting of archbishops. Now, the first uh, uh, and possibly the, one of the most important uh, things about Usher is that he, unlike Hampton, was Irish. He was born into a middle class Anglo Norman Dublin family. Um, uh, but unlike many of the Anglo Normans, he didn't become one of the old English, one of the Catholic Anglo Normans. Um, he actually took the Protestant route. He was one of the first students to go to Trinity College Dublin and there he got a, a thorough Protestant theological training uh, and eventually rose to the position of Professor of Theology. In 1621 he was appointed as Bishop of Meath and then of course as we've seen he succeeded Hampton in Armagh in 1625. Again, the interesting thing is the manner of his appointment, the patronage network uh, behind it. Uh, Usher did have a, an in with the king. He had visited England and, and we think met the king and impressed King James as a scholar, because James was, was himself a considerable scholar. Um, but the key figure in his promotion um, seems to have been one of Usher's uh, Puritan friends, Mary Vere, uh, wife of uh, an influential soldier, Sir Horace Vere, who at Usher's request used her influence with her brother-in-law, the Secretary of State, Sir Edward Conway, to push through uh, Usher's uh, appointment. In other words, whereas the drive behind Hampton's appointment had come from England, in Usher's case it came from Ireland. And where Hampton, of course, as we've seen, was deeply hostile to Puritanism, Usher had in fact secured his see through his Puritan contacts in England. So then we have, if you like, the facile um, uh, contrast that's the uh, results in the title of this talk. Uh, Hampton was clearly good with money. Um, uh, Usher, as we'll see, was remarkable for his brains. Uh, contemporaries uh, marveled at the scale and depth of Usher's learning. The great Dutch scholar Vossius said, it was impossible to extol Usher since his genius was beyond praise. A French-English scholar, Pierre de Moulin, uh, thought him a rare ornament not only to Great Britain and Ireland, but also to the whole Christian world. As Usher's friend, the English jurist John Selden put it, the primate of Armagh was a man of the highest piety, singular judgment and learned almost to a miracle. Now, of course, he was exaggerating, but the hyperbole was understandable. The depth uh, and the range of Usher's scholarship was remarkable. Um, the standard story told about him was that as a student, he decided to prepare himself for his uh, later studies by reading the whole of the Church Fathers. That's an enormous corpus in, in Greek and Latin. And this task took him 18 years. Uh, and as a mature scholar, he made significant advances in a whole range of different fields in patristic scholarship. Uh, he mastered all the biblical language and wrote extensively on the texts of the Bible. He worked on early creeds in the church and on uh, church history, in particular, uh, early Irish church history and the history of the church in the British Isles. He wrote about uh, political theory and, of course, most famously, as if, if you're a creationist, which I hope you're not, um, uh, he produced a standard chronology uh, of the Bible. I, I, I <laughs> uh, there's a lovely uh, entry on Usher in Wikipedia. Uh, where every so often the creationists get hold of it and extol Usher as a, a, the, the father of creationism. And I then you know, gently intervene and change it. And then the next day it's always changed back to Usher as the era of creationists you, you can't win. Um, above all, Usher loved libraries and research, and he had a gift for making exciting discoveries and turning up new source, uh, sources. Um, here, the most obvious example is his work on identifying the original letters of one of the earliest church fathers, Ignatius, um, and his work on that, sorting out the true from the spurious letter, uh, still stands with only minor corrections as a, a masterful piece of text textual detective work. Usher's stature as a scholar has then stood the test of time. And, you know, I've spent, what, four, 
46 years of my life studying Usher, um, and, and I can absolutely confirm that he is a terrifying erudite, and B, uh, you always have the feeling that you're dealing with someone who's learning as twice your own. From our point of view today, um, the key uh, works of Usher's were two of his historical works, which dealt specifically with the Church of Ireland. And these are important to us because they demonstrate the degree of Usher's engagement with uh, and identification with the Church of Ireland and how he helped shape its self-image. The first uh, work is, was published in its final edition in 1631, uh, a discourse of the religion anciently professed by the Irish and British. Um, as Usher outlined his uh, basic argument, it was that uh, the religion professed by the ancient bishops, priests, monks and other Christians in this land was for substance the very same with that which now by public authority is maintained therein, against the foreign doctrine brought in thither in later times by the Bishop of Rome's followers, etc. What was happening here was that Usher was applying the standard Reformation take uh, on religious history uh, to Ireland. As far as Protestant historians were concerned, the early church closest to Christ and the Bible had been pure and pristine. Um, only over time had it declined and become corrupted until finally in the 11th century, uh, the corruption was complete when the papacy was taken over by Antichrist. And of course, when you applied this model of early purity, later papal corruption uh, to the Church of Ireland, this model worked very neatly for Usher. What he sought to do in the discourse was to show that the Church of St. Patrick had been pure and in effect Protestant uh, and used his considerable historical skills to find as many differences as possible between the early Irish Church and the Church of Rome, suggesting that it was in fact semi-independent. Not until the 12th century after, in other words, after the rise of Antichrist was it fully taken over by Rome as Rome asserted its authority over the Irish Church by sending uh, by nominating bishops and archbishops. The Irish Reformation, uh, thus in the discourse, took on the appearance of a restoration of the early Irish church, removing all the later corruptions, transubstantiation, indulgences, worship of saints and images, purgatory that the anti-Christian papacy had introduced. So what was Usher trying to do in the discourse? Now, ostensibly, he was trying to win over his Catholic uh, countrymen to Protestantism, as he put it in the book's dedication to uh, an anti-Catholic Irish judge, uh, Sir Christopher uh, Sibthorpe. I somewhat incline to be of your mind that if unto the authorities drawn out of scriptures and fathers, a true discovery were added of that religion which anciently was professed in this kingdom, it might prove a special motive to introduce our, my poor countrymen to consider a little better of the old and true way from whence they have hitherto been misled. So far so good, but having stated this, in fact then Usher immediately rode back he was deeply pessimistic about the prospect of converting his fellow countrymen. As he went on, on the one side, that saying in the gospel runneth much in my mind. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And on the other, that heavy judgment mentioned by the apostle, um, the heath of the thought of Paul wrote Thessalonians, and because they revolt, receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe lies. The woeful experience whereof we may see daily before our eyes in this poor nation, where such as are slow of heart to believe the saving truth of God delivered by the prophets and apostles, do with all greediness embrace and with a most strange kind of credulity entertain those lying legends wherewith the monks and friars in these latter days have polluted the religion and, li religion and lives of our ancient saints. So you have there basically summed up uh, 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 Usher's fundamental historical framework. These are the latter days. This is an apocalyptic sense of decline and decay from early purity, the early purity being Protestant and the later decline and decay being the product of Catholicism. 
So in fact, uh, though rhetorically the book was supposed to convert Catholics, uh, what it really did, and did, as we'll see very successfully, was to provide the Church of Ireland with a respectable origin, a sense of its roots. And these roots, Usher sought to show, were in Ireland. Now, given that Irish Catholics generally and completely unsurprisingly saw the Protestant Reformation as a foreign imposition, uh, Usher's rewriting of church history, his claim that the early church in Ireland was pure and Protestant, not only gave the Reformation Irish roots, but it was clearly uh, directed um, at uh, those uh, people who were committed to the Church of Ireland. And what he was giving was, if you like, an alternative view of the origins of the Church of Ireland. There was an assumption commonly made by many of the English settlers newly arrived in Ireland that Ireland was simply an extension of England, little more than an English county. It was a, a part of the English crown, um, or in ecclesiastical terms, was an extension of the Church of England. And what Usher was trying to do was to show that no, the Church of Ireland was separate and independent. Um, and in his second work on the history of the Church of Ireland, The Antiquities of the British Churches, published in, 19, in 1639, Usher went into far more detail in describing the arrival of Christianity in Ireland and Britain. Now, generally speaking, this was a far less polemical work than the discourse, uh, but Usher, in the title he chose for the work, made one very fundamental point. This was not the antiquities of the British church, this was the antiquities of the British churches, plural. There wasn't one ancient church which included in Ireland. Ireland was and always had been a separate church. And indeed, when you look to the history of the spread of Christianity in the British Isles, Ireland was the one which developed most rapidly and most purely and actually helped spread Christianity to the north of Britain, Iona, and so on. So then. Usher the scholar brought luster to the Sea of Armagh through his extensive publications and his European-wide reputation. That said, as we mentioned in our opening, not all bishops are good at every aspect of their job. The obvious question is, of course, how good was Usher in doing the everyday administration of his diocese? And here, uh, doubts have been raised. Um, it's certainly true that during the 1620s, Usher was regularly absent from his diocese, pursuing his studies uh, and his relationship with his Calvinist friends in England. When appointed to Meath in 1621, he took several months to return to Ireland from England to take up his post. Similarly, in 1625, he was nominated primate in January 1625 when he was on a visit to England and remained there apart from a very brief during the visit to Ireland till August 1626 when he finally uh, returned uh, to his diocese. Such behaviour and his reluctance to uh, engage to, with uh, complicated issues such as the power of the ecclesiastical lawyers have led to suggestions that he was not particularly interested in the administrative and legal aspects of the primus office. This is a, an often repeated criticism and when you trace it back to where it actually came from, um, it goes back, I think, to one of the foremost historians of the uh, English uh, Reformation, uh, Bishop Gilbert Burnet. Um, I should mention, I suppose, here that the, the picture, the rather uh, 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 lovely picture which you see here is proof, uh, if proof were needed, that you cannot uh, believe all that you find uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, this is actually uh, the uh, real uh, Bishop Burnet. Burnett, in his life of one of Usher's fellow Irish bishops, William Beadle, was commenting on a dispute between uh, Beadle and Usher over ecclesiastical courts. Burnett suggested that Usher was too bookish and otherworldly to attend to the business side of his episcopal role. As uh, Burnett put it, um, Usher had all the innocence of the dove in him. He spent much of his time in those two best exercises, secret prayer and dealing with other people's consciences. And what remained, he dedicated to his studies so that he was certainly one of the best men his age has produced. But no man is entirely perfect. He was not made for the governing part of his function. He had too gentle a soul to manage that rough work of reforming abuses, and therefore he left things as he found them. As his physician said truly of him, if our primate of Armagh were as exact a disciplinarian, 
as he is eminent in searching antiquity, defending the truth and preaching the gospel, he might without doubt deserve to be made the chief churchman of Christendom. We have here a not untypical assumption that the uh, if a bishop is a scholar, then he wasn't much interested in immersing himself in the everyday task of running his see. But of course, we're historians, we have to ask the question whether this is true, and in order to answer it, we have to look uh, at the sources. We actually have a significant amount of material relating to Usher's time as Bishop of Meath and as Archbishop of Armagh. And during his first episcopate in Meath, um, he certainly does seem to have developed a thorough knowledge of his diocese despite his absences. The most obvious test was the 1622 visitation, which we've already quoted in relation to Hampton's engagement with building in Armagh. In the case of Meath, Usher's report on his diocese in 1622 is one of the fullest made of any diocese in Ireland at the time and enables us to get a thorough picture of the working of the sea, one that's not without its problems, but one where the bishop clearly knew what was going on. And indeed, when we turn to Armagh um, uh, and see uh, the diocesan records, we discover clearer evidence for a direct hands-on approach by Usher. The late Bob Hunter, uh, that wonderfully detailed historian, um, whose work on the sea lands of Armagh I've relied on so much in this talk, found evidence in the diocesan records of the Public Record of Office of Northern Ireland in Belfast, of course, as I understand it, uh, uh, Robert, you'll be hearing about the Dawson records uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, and he used these records to show that Usher was in fact personally uh, involved in administering the sea estate and did extensive research to try and establish their extent and what dues and rents were payable and how these could be recovered. These documents with invaluable critical notes by Usher give us a clear picture of Usher as in Bob Hunter's words, extraordinarily painstaking. As a result, by 1640, the combined rents of the sea lands in Armagh and Tyrone was 2,300 and the total sea revenues were around 3,500. This was a, a very substantial stump, sum for an Irish bishopric and even a respectable one for a sea uh, in England. We can't, it's true, put all this improvement down to Usher. Uh, Bramall and Wentworth um, uh, in Dublin took the uh, lead in improving Episcopal revenues across uh, the Church of Ireland, although Usher naturally cooperated happily with them in this process. In other words, Usher did, in fact, involve himself and involve himself effectively in the nitty gritty of sea administration. So what was Burnett on about? Well, of course, Burnett did not do any original research in the sea archives, and he was also writing a laudatory, almost hagiographical biography of William Beadle, who, had, as we said, quarreled with Usher over the ecclesiastical courts. As a result, he was happy to justify uh, Beadle's complaint against Usher by trotting out this familiar stereotype of the naive scholar immersed in his books and uninterested in the practicalities of everyday life. Where Usher and Hampton did differ was in two other issues. First, in their attitude towards Puritanism. Hampton was, as we've seen, a stickler for conformity, but Usher had a far more relaxed approach. Uh, Usher had, in fact, been educated under a leading English Puritan uh, at Trinity, the colleagues have been Walter Travers. Uh, and Usher, as we've seen uh, uh, in relation to his promotion, when he went to England, he normally moved in Puritan circles. Now, the willingness of Usher and also the Church of Ireland to tolerate and accept Puritan clergy was partly a matter of pragmatism. The Church was desperate for preachers, but Usher's personal friendship with Puritans in England um, suggests that he was, as it were, a fellow traveller. It was not simply a matter of pragmatism, it was also a matter of principle. For Usher, and the Church of Ireland saw itself as a broad church, willing to embrace a much wider range of churchmanship than the Church of England. For its leaders, such as Usher, the enemy was not nonconformity or Puritanism, and not fellow Protestants. The enemy was the Catholic Church, the overwhelming majority of the Irish population. And Usher was happy to accept clergy of whatever kind of churchmanship who were willing to join together in fighting what he saw as anti-Catholic, anti-Christianity. 
Hampton's point of reference, of course, was very different. His point of reference was the Church of England. Hence, he found the Church of Ireland out of step with his norms. Hence, the strong measures he tried to take against Puritans. But Hampton's efforts actually had very little effect for a very simple reason. The Church of, England, of Ireland was not the Church of England. As we've seen in England, there was an elaborate disciplinary process founded on the canons of 1604, but the Church of Ireland didn't have this structure. There were no canons. There was no requirement for clergy to subscribe. More than that, the confession of the Church of Ireland, probably drafted by Usher, the 1615 articles, was specifically designed to take account of Puritan theological and ecclesiological concerns. The differing approaches of Hampton and Usher um, was abundantly evident in the later 1620s and in the 1630s in relation to the question of Scottish Presbyterian clergy in the Ulster plantation about which Hampton had been so concerned. When Usher became Archbishop, there were a significant number of Scots clergy who'd uh, fled from the efforts to impose uniformity uh, in the Church of Scotland and fled to Ireland where they'd been accepted as Church of Ireland clergy uh, and ministers. As a result, the Church of Ireland had a significant uh, Scots Presbyterian uh, minority uh, in Ulster, particularly um, in Antrim uh, and Dan. Uh, Usher was perfectly happy to tolerate this, and it wasn't until his hand was forced uh, in the 1630s when William Lord, the Archbishop of Cantry, tried to bring the Church of Ireland into line with his mother church, the Church of England, and dispatched Will, um, um, John Bramall uh, to Ireland as Bishop of Derry in 1633, charged with making sure that nonconformity was stamped out. And what uh, Bramall and Wentworth did in the Convocation of 1634 was finally to insist that the Church of Ireland had to have a, uh, the same confession as the Church of England, the 39 Articles, and also had to draw up a complete set of disciplinary canons modelled on those of 1604. And then in 1635-7, to seven, um, these measures were enforced. The Scots clergy were forced to subscribe and had to abandon their parishes and leave the Church of Ireland. The Usher loyally accepted what, of course, was royal policy. It was clear that he was unhappy at the direction this policy was taken. He had no interest in pursuing Presbyterians so long as they were good pastors. As far as Usher was concerned, he was in agreement with the Scots clergy theologically and could tolerate differences with regard to liturgy and ceremonies. And this points to uh, the second difference between Hampton uh, and Usher their relationship to the Church of Ireland and to its independence. Hampton was, like Bramall, an English cleric who saw the Church of England as normative and wanted to ensure that the Church of Ireland follow those norms as quick, as closely as possible. Usher, on the other hand, was Irish born, and as we've seen in our account of his two historical works on the Church of Ireland, saw the Church of England not as the mother, but as the sister, indeed the younger sister, uh, of the of the uh, of the church so the church of ireland uh, uh, um let me get this um little genealogical teaser straight usher saw the church of england not as the mother but as the sister as the younger sister of the church of ireland so where does this leave us it's clear then that hampton and usher had contrasting or you could argue complementary talents Usher was clearly one of the intellectual giants of the Church of Ireland. Hampton had the hard-headed ability to ensure that the enormous opportunity offered by the Ulster Plantation was seized with both hands to ensure that the sea was adequately endowed, laying the basis for its future prosperity. And they came, in a way, in the right sequence for the church. Hampton built up the sea revenues, which Usher was later, and his later successors was able to enjoy as he pursued his scholarly career. We should be wary, though, as we've seen, of stereotypes. While it's clear that Usher spent considerable time in his studies, uh, 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 he was a responsible and hardworking prelate, and the idea that he was an otherworldly academic neglecting his see is hard to sustain. Usher and Hampton are, though, illustrative of much more than different personality traits. They, in fact, represent the twin poles of the Irish Episcopate and how different Irish bishops saw the Church of Ireland. Hampton was an Englishman who came over to Ireland without any previous experience of the church there, 
and naturally his instinctive response to what he found when he arrived in Ireland was to compare it with the Church of England which, with which he was familiar uh, and to set about conforming the Church of Ireland to the Church of England. Usher on the other hand was a proud Irishman who in his studies repeatedly sought to prove that the Church of Ireland was an independent entity. Hampton and Usher also jointly represent the future of the Irish Episcopate in another sense. Right down to disestablishment in 1870, the Church of Ireland's Episcopal bench was split between two different kinds of appointment. On the one hand, there were those bishops who were of uh, Irish Protestant stock, often educated at Trinity College Dublin, who saw themselves as Irish and tended to see the Church of Ireland as distinct from its sister church, the Church of England. On the other hand, were English-born bishops, often with very senior roles in the Dublin administration, who saw their position, their role as being to uh, see that the Church of Ireland followed obediently the standards of its English mother. The contrast could be a sharp one, especially in the 18th century when the bishops were an important ally for the government in the House of Lords. Archbishop King of Dublin, born in the north of Ireland of Presbyterian stock, thus was a natural successor of Usher in terms of his attitude to Ireland and the independence of the Church of Ireland. In contrast to someone such as Hugh Bolter, uh, an Oxford educated English cleric who was brought over to Ireland for the first time in 1724 uh, and made Archbishop of Armagh to ensure that Archbishop King of Dublin didn't get the place. Bolter was a, an important political figure who saw his main duty as preserving the English influence in Ireland, most particularly by ensuring that there were sufficient English born bishops to staff the House of Lords. He despised Irish bishop uh, and uh, regularly sought to use his influence to secure the appointment of Englishmen. In the end, of course, it was Usher's vision of the Church of Ireland as an exclusively Irish church, which triumphed in 1870 when the church was uh, deprived of its linkage to the English state and disestablished. Repeatedly, uh, at the end of the 19th century and through to the middle of the 20th century, histories of the Church of Ireland, acutely aware of the newly independent church's need to be Irish, its need for roots, happily regurgitated Usher's vision of its early history as a pure Protestant institution from which the Church of Ireland was descended. That said, Usher's rather forced Protestantization of the early Irish church eventually crumbled under the pressure of modern historical research. And finally, in the later 20th century, the Church of Ireland belatedly recognized that the Catholic church was a legitimate church which would claim direct descent from the uh, early Irish church. So how do we conclude our comparison of these two archiepiscopal successors? Well, there's no simplistic contrast between brains and money, in that Usher, in contrast to Hampton, was not an ineffectual manager of the sea finances. But that said, each made their distinctive contribution to the Sea of Armagh and to the Church of Ireland, eh, and each eh, represented a distinct strand, a distinct and different eh, strand eh, of the Church of Ireland's sense of its identity.